I am delighted to both say, hey, this is the last ground rounds of the academic year. We look forward to seeing everybody starting up again September 8th, so right after Labor Day. Um, and a quick but deeply felt thanks to Doan for organizing all this every week. And as somebody who's been up here repeatedly introducing folks, man, she makes it really easy and it's been outstanding. Um, it is my real delight to introduce Jana Murti, who's our uh, speaker for today, who's going to talk about chronic critical illness and post-intensive care syndrome prevention and treatment. So the thing about Jana that I sort of noticed, um, she's been with us now for three years. And where most of us will do with one, she seems to like to do two. So she went to the University of Michigan, which we can make an aside about having too many people from the University of Michigan here, but lots of folks from the University of Michigan where she got two bachelor's degrees um, for whatever interesting reason, she got two of them, um, and then moved on to a PhD at Johns Hopkins um, and did that in neuroscience. And then went on to her medicine residency at Penn and then back to Hopkins for cardiology fellowship. And again, where one would do, now she's got two bachelor's degrees and MD, PhD. She went and did the thing that has been singularly valuable to us, particularly at Montlake, which is get a critical care fellowship. So she is a cardiology critical care trained physician, and that is what she does for us at Montlake, which has been absolutely outstanding. As somebody who shares time with her in the CCU, that difference between the training and experience and expertise she brings in caring for critical care ventilators and sepsis and all the other things has just been fantastic for the care of our patients and really a joy um, to work with. And on a personal note, Jan is just awesome to work with. Love having her around and she's really raised the caliber of not just the care that we deliver in the CCU, uh, CICU, all of our ICUs, but also just kind of the general demeanor of get the work done, but do it with good humor until it's been really too long. And then like recognize, oh my gosh, I've been doing this long enough for this last two or three weeks that I need a break. And just being really pragmatic about some of the things that are involved in taking care of critical, critically ill patients. So she's been an, uh, an absolute joy to have around uh, and a real key addition to our faculty as a cardiology critical care trained doc. So I'm really happy to introduce her for Grand Rounds. Wow, I think, oh. Can you hear me? I don't know. I unmuted. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. Um, as Karen mentioned, I am sort of this hybrid role between a critical care provider and a cardiologist. And so I thought I'd try to take on a topic that's important and sort of not well defined within the cardiac community and sort of bring it to everyone's attention and awareness. Um, so, oh gosh. Hmm. I have no mouse and I have no ability to advance. <laughs> it was working earlier. Sorry about this. I'm, I'm not using my own computer and I'm a Mac user. So this is out of my element here. <clears throat> okay. Oh, perfect. Thank you. So I have no disclosures. Um, so the uh, continuing education objectives for this talk are to recognize chronic critical illness and post-intensive care syndrome as disease syndromes that are distinct from the initial acute presentation of the illness, to understand the impact of these disease processes on patients, family, and societies, to understand some strategies for prevention, as well as possible treatment of chronic critical care and PCIS, and to know and implement some outpatient strategies when we encounter these patients who have survived their critical illness. <clears throat> Gosh. So the outline of the talk is we'll kind of talk about the definition and the schema of this disease process. We'll discuss the epidemiology and impact and burden. We'll highlight one uh, seminal paper that sort of discusses the timing of this transition from acute to chronic critical illness. And then I will try to convince you that this is not just true for MICU patients, but is true in the modern CICU patient population. And then we'll discuss some prevention and treatment protocols. <clears throat> so historically, we sort of have a model of critical care that is an acute event happens to a patient. They either recover from this acute event and return to their functional baseline, or they die of, and succumb to their critical illness. However, in the modern era, we've become increasingly good at taking care of 
ICU level patients. So this is a paper from Zimmerman et al. where they <clears throat> looked at uh, uh, billing codes for a significant number of ICU patients, nearly 500,000 admissions over several uh, segments of time. And you can note that in the black line, the hospital mortality from the late 80s till now has decreased about 35% relatively, despite increasing age and increasing severity of illness throughout the same interval of time. Notably, a decrease in the hospital mortality was accompanied by an increase in discharge to SNF and a decrease in discharge to home in the same patient population. And so we have to sort of redefine our schema of ICU illness to account for this new and emerging population that are increasingly complex, and that is the chronic critically ill. Those patients who neither seem to recover nor to die, but to sort of linger in the ICU and or spend protracted periods of time in the ICU. And then the sequelae of whatever segment of those patients survive their critical illness, then de uh, develop a syndrome called post-intensive care syndrome, whereby which they have some uh, ongoing um, disease symptoms and syndromes that are difficult and challenging in the outpatient setting. So as sort of described in the schematic, some basic definitions. So chronic clinical illness is a disease state in which the <clears throat> uh, intensive care patients survive their ICU level admission, cardiogenic shock, sepsis, respiratory failure, but then go on to have persistent organ dysfunction requiring ongoing high level of care for weeks, months, potentially even years. And then some segment of those patients actually recover from this uh, disease state of chronic critical illness. They go on to go home or to a rehab facility and they continue to have ongoing sequelae of that. So what are the reasons that patients get quote unquote stuck in the ICU? I mean, the predominant one is mechanical ventilation, but some of, and certainly in our, our ICU patient population, ongoing renal replacement therapy that is done in a manner that is not compatible with outpatient, sort of four hour hemodialysis, or this persistent presser requirement. You will frequently hear people just sort of discussing it as vasoplegia, uh, where we can't get people off leave of fed, and then we ultimately end up starting things like midodrin. And then in our cardiac patient population, they can have a persistent need for mechanical circulatory support. <clears throat> so these patients who develop this chronic critical illness, you know, have a sequelae of disease that is undoubtedly multifactorial and diverse, and not every patient has every item on this list, but um, we can certainly recognize a lot of this in our patient population. So they have either mechanical ventilation needs or just respiratory failure needs that require an ICU level care. They often and more predominantly require an ICU level of weakness that uh, requires significant occupational and physical uh, therapy, delirium and cognitive dysfunction, neuroendocrine dysfunction. They become now nourished and asarcic. They're vulnerable to an increased number of infections. They have skin breakdown. And then symptomatically, they have depression, anxiety. They're unable to often communicate to their providers in a meaningful way. They also have pain, thirst, and ongoing dyspnea. So as we move forward through the hospital stay, hopefully for these patients, they can develop what is called a post-intensive care syndrome in the outpatient setting. And the hallmark things that remain are often this ICU required weakness, cognitive dysfunction and psychiatric impairment. But additionally, there are broad impacts on their ability to socialize and regain uh, uh, their same level of enjoyment in society. And then they have employment impairment as well. So <clears throat> as we look through uh, the literature on this, there's it's a difficult patient population to define. Um, and we talk about the epidemiology. One such study that attempted using sort of billing data looked at uh, several uh, hospital admissions occurring over many years, and they estimated the uh, current ICU population across multiple studies to be about 10%. The annual mortality of this patient population was thought to be greater than uh, 50%, with the in-hospital mortality calculated about 30% uh, for chronic critical illness. 
Um, the, they used um, several ICU admissions. The predominant one that's relevant for the cardiac population was the ongoing need for mechanical ventilation, tracheostomy, a prior stroke and, or stroke during the admission, as well as ongoing presser and ionotropic support were included in this population. Um, <clears throat> Not quite right. So the there was a negative impact in another study when they this is a group out of UK. They studied several patients um, who were in an ICU for greater than 48 hours. Um, the UK patient population actually has a extensive 30-year study on these patients. And they studied these patients uh, at six months and at 12 months of post-ICU discharge. And there was a negative impact on the family income with about 33% of all patients at uh, six months, 28% of uh, at 12 months, 50% of the of population reported that their employment was the sole source of their income. And about 25% of patients who were discharged from the ICU still required help with their ADLs at six months and at 12 months. 80% of that care was provided by their family of, um, and that obviously has implications for the family's ability to work. Mobility was the number one problem that was reported, but severe and ongoing pain, as well as depression and anxiety symptoms were very common amongst the population and were sort of persistent upon reassessment. So when we look at sort of an SF score, which is a patient reporting variable of sort of what they experience in terms of physical function, physical role that they're able to do, pain, general health, vitality, and social functioning, these scores are incredibly low. They go to 100 and they're relatively intractable. So at six months, those scores are quite low and there's virtually no improvement in those patient reported outcomes at the 12 month interval. And so when we look at the economic costs of the survivor family, um, about 40% at six months in the gray and then the dark gray at 12 months um, were um, getting their income from employment, but many people had to arrange to leave work, reduce their hours, change their jobs, or give up their job entirely. And so when we look at the sole source of income, we see employment as the major um, uh, income source, and that switches to state required support and a mixed support system in survivors of the ICU. So um, as we sort of try to define what this disease state is, um, there's one seminal paper from <clears throat> New Zealand and Australia where they looked at greater than 1 million ICU admissions across 180 ICUs. They took these patients with high risk diagnoses, and they did some modeling to look at the severity of their illness. Um, and you can see here, gosh, you can see here that, um, so the purple is the severity of illness at ICU admission. Using variables like the Apache score and other things, they were able to predict um, how long you'd be in the ICU and your survival from that critical illness up till about 10 days, then the sort of antecedent characteristics of the patient population took over and were no more predictive than the uh, patient factors regarding their initial presentation. I think this is highlighted more clearly here. So they broke down the patient population in these ICU admissions to high, moderate, and low probability of death on admission. So the red would be high, which means that like their admission criteria, SOPA, Apache score, things like that, indicated that they had a 66% chance of death, whereas the low population in the purple at the bottom had a less than 33% chance of death. And again, you can see sort of a regression in the mean, in this case, fatality of these patient populations where they no longer separate. And in fact, the probability of death decreases in the high risk patient population, but increases in the low risk patient population with sort of a regression to this sort of median state. And so they defined that time transition point to be approximately 10 days. 
And this transition varied across sub, sub cohorts, um, most notably the first and second line, I think are relevant to this group. So in the cardiac surgery population and the cardiovascular population, the column is a little confusing. One, the column all the way on the right is just where we lose statistical significance. The uh, column on the left is sort of where the model breaks down entirely. Um, obviously there's a wider range in the cardiac surgery patient population than in the cardiovascular patient population, but notably the cardiovascular patient population transition appears to be around 10 days, similar to the global patient population. And then when they took these patients and then they just said, okay, if we use 10 days as our sort of uh, stochastic way to separate these groups, we uh, can sort of look at their characteristics. And of course, the risk of death on admission was substantially higher in those patients, the column on the right, where they had stayed greater than 10 days in the ICU. Additionally, the total length of ICU stay was significantly longer. Um, notably, the rate of death discharge to somewhere other than home um, and you know, was increased in the patients who stayed in the ICU longer, suggesting that's also consistent with the chronic critical in this population. So even though these patients were only 5% of the total number of admissions that they had in this sort of 1 million cohort, um, these patients occupied 32.8% of ICU bed days and 14.7% and of hospital bed days with a mortality in the hospital that was about 25% with less than half of patients going to home. So as we begin to define this critical care population, become increasingly important to help us prognosticate in our ICU patient populations. And so one additional prognostication study that's been extensively val validated was the PROVENT trial. And they looked at patients requiring long-term mechanical ventilation in the ICU. And the score is only based on five parameters, age, platelets, the need for vasopressors, need for renal replacement therapy, and trauma, which is protective. And if zero of five were present, then the patient had a greater than 80% chance of surviving the ICU stay and presumably weaning from the ventilator. Um, but if five out of five were present, virtually 100% of the patients died within one year. So as we have these discussions with our patients with prolonged me mechanical ventilation in the ICU, this is an important factor for making these decisions. So as we begin to sort of talk more about this population, hopefully I've convinced you that this is a reasonable disease state to, um, to study and to think about with a high burden of illness and impact on society. But it appears perhaps that this is more relevant to the MICU rather than the CCU population. So I would like to discuss the work of the CCCTN trial. Um, and this is an ongoing clinical trial across uh, 16 tertiary care center centers where we're looking at all the variables related to admission in the modern ICU. And while the top diagnosis for admission into an ICU for cardiac etiology were ACS and heart failure, the primary indications for ICU level care were actually respiratory failure as number one shock was mixed, cardiogenic, septic, and perhaps mixed with both as the next, and then unstable arrhythmia and cardiac arrest being the, the uh, remaining two. Um, and if we look at these, they carry a very different mortality rate. So the respiratory insufficiency had a lower rate of mortality than say cardiac arrest, which had an extremely high level of cardiac mortality. But I think notably, as you see on the admissions, which is the first panel A, there were 40% of patients admitted to a modern critical care unit that not, did not need actual critical care. So some were permitted for just post-procedural observation, the second from the bottom, and then this need, perceived need for frequent monitoring and laboratory testing. So those patients had an overall mortality that was significantly less at like 0.2 compared to all these other disease states that actually required ICU level care. And then if we break this down a little bit more, what were the things that we were doing that were ICU level care? Advanced respiratory therapies, including non-invasive and mechanical ventilation, 
was approximately 30% with around 20 patients requiring mechanical ventilation in the modern ICU. And then cardiac hemodynamic management appears to be more, but I will say that notably this intravenous vasopressor ionotrope dilator category also includes sepsis, right? So we don't know if the levofed was for cardiogenic shock or septic shock. But mechanical circulatory support was less than 10%. Renal replacement therapy was um, significantly lower at less at 6%. And then, of course, targeted temperature management. So overall, the mortality in this patient population was uh, 10% in hospital. However, about 37% of these patients were triaged for the ICU for perceived monitoring that didn't actually require ICU level care with significantly decreased mortality rate, um, suggesting that those numbers are somewhat padded and that our ICU level mortality might be more, much more consistent with a medical ICU. Among survivors, 18% uh, were discharged to a rehab facility and 77% were discharged to home. So if we take our you know, schema of illness, just using the solid numbers from the study, death was 11%. But I think if you take out that 40% that never needed to be in the ICU, that number is substantially higher at 16.9% with some back at the you know, napkin kind of calculations. So we think that's an underrepresentation. And then we certainly can come, we can't comment on chronic critical illness because we don't know the length of ICU level stay, but we can certainly comment on post-intensive care syndrome. And so if we just take the number of patients who were discharged to SNF, that's 17%. However, again, if we stop padding the numbers with that 37%, that becomes 41% of survivors of the ICU that went to SNF as we, if we take out those low-risk patient populations. The truth is probably somewhere in the middle of that, but certainly at least 17%, if not higher. So primary efforts towards decreasing the burden and suffering will involve, involve the ICU liberation bundle. And this bundle is recognized by the Society of Critical Care Medicine, as well as the AHA and ACC as guideline-based medical care for the ICU. Um, so I will primarily, there are now, we're developing a little bit of an alphabet soup in the ICU liberation bundle, but I'm gonna focus on the A, B, C, D, E, as that seems to have the most uh, evidence, which is not to imply that family and all these other variables are not also important. So if we take them sort of one by one, um, uh, a is for pain, so we should assess and manage pain. It should be routinely assessed by nursing and because pain is associated with delirium. And as we'll see as we go through sort of the ICU liberation bundle, delirium seems to be one of the most augmenting variables towards these outcomes for patients. Opiate medications are also associated with delirium, so we should favor non-opioid analgesics to reduce the opiate requirements and opiate related side effects. We should try to use non-pharmacological methods and we can consider regional blocks for traumatic blood vectors and other things. Um, moving on to perhaps the more meat of the <clears throat> data, B is for SATs and SBTs. So the goals of IC level sedation are to keep the patient calm and comfortable, reduce anxiety and agitation, potentially to facilitate mechanical ventilation, but I'll discuss some of the data suggesting that may not be necessary, and then to decrease the traumatic memory from ICU stay in procedures. So what is an SAT? An SAT are the daily stopping of narcotics and sedatives every day, not weaning, completely stopping. And then if needed, we restart the narcotic or sedative at half the previous dose and then titrate to patient symptoms. So what's the data that supports using this? So there's a study in the New England Journal of Medicine, it's now 20 years old. A daily SAT shortens the sedation, the role of mechanical ventilation and using this Kaplan-Meier curve. The percentage, this is percent of patients remaining on, IC, on mechanical ventilation and hospital day as the y-axis. You can clearly see there's a statistically significant difference between the intervention and control group. And then if we look at patients remaining in the ICU, again, the curve's perhaps not as uh, well separated, but the median length of stay was decreased by three days for the intervention and control group as well. Um, additionally, deep sedation appears to worsen ICU 
level of in, uh, outcomes. So looking at um, the patients remaining in the ICU as well as survival, um, you can see that having a RAS score that was low. So we'll, I will skip one slide ahead and then come back. So for those who haven't been in the ICU for some time, a RAS score is a nursing and provider-wide uh, assessment. They characterized um, anything over one as being anxious or, and then they aimed for a goal of zero to negative two. So that is a patient that is drowsy or lightly sedated. That is a person who is responsible to verbal cues in the room. And then everything that is three and below, those are patients that need to be touched when you walk into the room for them to be aroused. So moving back, we can see, um, I'm sorry, moving forward. Every RAS assessment that they did within the deep sedation range in the first 44 hours, 48 hours was associated with a delayed time to extubation. So at any nurse assessment where a patient was, had a RAS that was greater than negative three, negative three or greater, de delayed the time to extubation by 12 hours, increased the risk of hospital death, and increased the total risk of death at six months. Suggesting that it's very important that we maintain appropriate level of sedation in the ICU. And there's one study out of Europe probably a challenging study to do in the United States, but mechanical ventilation and support can be given without sedation. Um, this group, uh, the control group was no sedation in green. And uh, also the, in the experiment, the sort of standard care was sedation, whatever the provider sedation mechanism of choice was. Patients receiving no sedation had less ventilator, had statistically significant ventilator-free days. So that number was in the experimental group and the control group were significantly different. The ICU level length of stay and hospital length of stay was also uh, significantly different. However, tracheostomy and ventilated associated pneumonia were unchanged. So, you know, we think of sedation as a mechanism of how to safely provide mechanical ventilation in the ICU patient population. But one study, relatively small, suggested that, in fact, sedation is inferior to ventilator adjustments for patients with ven patient ventilator mismatch. And these were just patients who were breath stacking, just simply going to the bedside, changing the ventilator parameters for the patient, uh, changed um, their amount of dyssynchrony. So moving on, mechanical ventilation is also associated with, associated with many uh, complications. Discontinuation of mechanical ventilation at the earliest time is critically important. About 40% of the time on the ventilator is spent on weaning. And SVT, just for definition's sake, is designed to assess whether or not the patient's respiratory mechanics are favorable enough to consider a liberation from mechanical ventilation. So this, the kind of primary indication for an SVT comes from the Hallmark AVC trial in Lancet, where they looked at an SAT, which is this awakening trial paired with an SVT uh, versus the usual care plus an SVT. And they found uh, patients on the ventilator, patient events on the ventilator uh, to be decreased time on the ventilator, as well as um, uh, their overall survival. So the intervention group had less time on the ventilator, they left the ICU sooner, they left the hospital sooner, and they died less. So of every seven patients in the interventional group, one life was saved with a number needed to treat of 7.4. Just for comparison, I put some of our favorite medications up there as cardiologists with substantially different number needed to treat. So C on the ICU liberation bundle is to use minimal dose of sedation to achieve RAS, and then to carefully choose sedatives and analgesic medications, as well as consider medication doses, titration, and discontinuation. Primary um, thoughts on this are that benzodiazepines are bad. They're strongly linked to delirium, and they're a dose-dependent response. Um, from the trial in anesthesiology, you can see that the 
dose of benzo, although astronomically high in this setting was strongly linked to delirium. We certainly don't give 40, but back in the day when we used to use drips of benzodiazepines, certainly the total daily dose could equal 40. That is no longer thought to be the standard of care, but this paper sort of marked that change in transition. But, you know, uh, Ativan was an independent risk factor for daily transition to delirium. So what do we use instead? Dexamethamidine decreases delirium and coma. Um, so here uh, we have uh, some plots from this trial, from the men's trial, showing sort of val validity, comparing dexamethamidine to lorazepam. There's a study also uh, controlling to Versed with similar results. And it, it just certainly decreased delirium free day, increased delirium free days, coma free days, and combined were all improved by using dexamethamidine. And then the patients who were actually in their targeted RAS, which is critically important, as we know that dropping into a RAS goal that's lower has a poor prognostic sign, were significantly improved. And although not uh, statistically significant, the 90, the 28 day mortality in this group was also improved. Again, not statistically significant, but 17 versus 27%. And so moving on to possibly the most important component of the bundle is delirium. So delirium is a disturbance in attention and awareness that develops over a short period of time, hours to days and fluctuates. About 80% of patients in the hospital acquire delirium. The majority of it is in the ICU. The average time to onset is between day two and day three. There's two types, hyperactive. I think that's the one we all know. They're agitated, they're restless, they're emotionally liable. They have an overall better prognosis. However, there's a significant hypoactive delirium that with decreased responsiveness, withdrawal, and apathy, that remains largely unrecognized in 60 to 80% of hospitalized patients and is actually thought to be more deleterious in the long term. So surprising no one, um, age is a risk factor for increased risk for having delirium in the hospital, as well as how sick you are as measured by an Apache score, okay. also strongly correlated with delirium. Other risk factors though are benzos and narcotics. They're found in 98% of cases of delirium in the hospital. In, the ones in this major study. Pre-existing cognitive impairment, use of psychoactive drugs, mechanical ventilation, untreated pain, as well as a whole host of other things. So what's the impact? So strong predictor for increased length of mechanical ventilation, longer ICU stays, increased costs, long-term cognitive impairment, as well as mortality. The effect of delirium appears to be cumulative and the studying respiratory care. They looked at the number of days that the patient was delirious in their overall survival. So uh, the top being zero days, the bottom being 10 plus days. You can see a pretty impressive separation that uh, no delirium is best. Lots of days of delirium is bad. And the, most we can, the more we can do to prevent and decrease the duration of delirium likely has a survival probability that's important. Well, how do we treat delirium? Well, the MEN trial uh, took away the R1 primary tool in the toolbox. Um, so they tested Zeprazidone and Haldol, and they found no change in days with coma, days with delirium, or days alive without delirium or coma, suggesting that these should not be first-line therapy. Um, delirium developed in 48% of the spike population, and 89% had hypoactive delirium. And um, the probability of overall survival not improved by prophylactically giving Zeprazidone or Haldol in the study. Um, when we look at the impact of delirium, I think the hallmark study is brain ICU from the Vanderbilt group. Uh, they found delirium affected 74% of patients in their hospital stay with a median duration of four days. They followed these patients at three and 12 months post-ICU discharge with an R-bands test. It's sort of an Alzheimer's cognitive function test. And a trial-making test, notably 31% of patients died between enrollment and, and, six, and three months of testing, suggesting, as we've been seeing over and over again, high mortality in this patient population. 
and another 7% died within the 12 month follow up. Um, when they looked at the effect of their R band score for this cognitive test as a function of days of delirium, there's a negative impact of days of delirium on the overall R band score. And I think the most impressive part of the study is they separated the patients by age with the column on the left being those less than uh, 49 years of age and those uh, greater than 65 on the right. The normal patient group is the area in the green on this graph. The red dotted line is uh, mild cognitive impairment. Uh, the blue dotted line is Alzheimer's disease and the middle dotted line is traumatic brain injury. And so you can see that ICU survivors largely do not overlap the cognitive function in the normal group and that a significant portion of them uh, have cognitive function that's similar to a traumatic brain injury or to Alzheimer's disease despite surviving their, criti their critical illness. So I think the longer the duration of delirium in the hospital is associated with worse global cognition and executive function scores and um, long-term cognitive impairment. So what can we do about it? As, I, as we mentioned, there's not much we're gonna do with a typical antipsychotics or typical antipsychotics, um, largely systematically eliminating the risk factors for delirium. When a large scale, they looked at the number of risk factors for delirium, the average number of patients had 11 with a range of three to 17. So the first step should be just a systematic review of the risk and eliminate those factors as well as possible promoting sleep hygiene and preventing of sleep disturbance. And then I think really the only evidence-based medicine that we have is early and progressive mobilization. So that moves us to E in the liberation bundle, early mobility, critically ill patients can lose up to 25% of muscle mass. This occurs within four days of mechanical ventilation and 18% body weight change by the time of discharge. This is all bundled into something that we just sort of blanket describe as ICU level weakness, which probably describes multiple disease states. Approximately one third of patients leaving the ICU have this. The EDLs, these are just atrophy and disuse wasting, but they can also have a polyneuropathy with actual nerve damage and a myopathy um, that actually uh, changes the uh, neuromuscular substrate of these patients. So early exercise and mobility improves ICU level outcomes and functional status. Um, this was by Schweikart at Penn. Their group looked at an SAT combined with physical therapy in the four, first 48 hours of ICU level admission. I think that data is incredibly critical. Um, and they found a statistically significant difference between the control and the intervention group in, the, in this setting. Um, notably, um, when you look at what the outcome of these patients were, the intervention group, which is in sort of the salmon color and the control group, which did not have the early intervention on all of these measures, walking, grooming, activities of daily living, there was a significant improvement, as well as where you went upon discharge from the hospital with the intervention group to going from 28% going to home, 24% um, going to home, all the way, increased all the way to 43%, which is a pretty significant outcome for just implementing exercise early in the ICU stay when the patients are the most critically ill. Unfortunately, it didn't apply in all studies. And this uh, other large randomized trial uh, enrolled patients in an intensive PT program after four days of ICU level care, and they found no statistically significant difference, suggesting that perhaps the earlier intervention is important. And then lastly, I think, with all of these data, I think the combination is better than the sum of the parts. So there was a prospective multi-center cohort study that looked at the complete ABCDE bundle over 15,000 ICU stays. And the y-axis on this study is the percentage of patients that, uh, the percentage of the bundle that was met in the patient, and then the probability of the patient needing or having the symptom or support. So as you can see for mechanical ventilation, as we got to 100% of compliance with the ABCDF bundle, the, the, the burden of mechanical ventilation decreased, delirium decreased, coma decreased, physical strains decreased. However, pain 
did statistically significantly increase in this patient population. And then I think, you know, the real data is here, the re ICU readmission during the index hospital stay when we got to 100% was markedly low compared to where it was before and then discharge to a facility also decreasing from 40% to slightly to about 25%, so relatively significant. And then death, also important variable, markedly increased by the uh, percent compliance with just doing the bundle for the standard of care. So treatment is largely prevention. There are no great treatments for helping these patients post ICU discharge. Um, but you can see that they're gonna be a complex uh, patient population with pharmacy needs, durable medical equipment needs, so lots of subspecialty medical care, optimal rehab therapy and exercise therapy, a lot of mental health needs and diagnosis, treatment with speech and language and cognitive mediation, and then uh, just sort of mental health needs with specialty care for depression and anxiety. And so how do we treat that? I don't know, there's no good data. Several academic centers are doing trials and are focusing on providing post-ICU clinics that are prepared to perform quantitative and qualitative metrics of these patients, such as six-minute walk tests, and that have multidisciplinary staffing, including PT, OT, speech and language, diet, social worker, palliative care, RN, and lastly, a physician, as I think that they're probably the least needed person in this, in this patient population. But I think, you know, they're a complex patient. They show up in cardiology clinic. They have cognitive dysfunction. They have a med list that's very long and complex medical care. And it's a very difficult treatment paradigm that really requires care that's outside of the specialization of our, cardi our cardiac training. So in conclusion, chronic critical illness and post-intensive care are disease syndromes that are distinct from the acute critical illness phase. Some reasonable data suggests that this transition point occurs at about day 10 of the ICU. The in-hospital mortality is high, 15, maybe 30%. The annual mortality probably exceeds 50%. Prevention is the mainstay of care. The only data that we have is the ABCDE bundle. That decreases delirium and likely decreases chronic critical illness and post-intensive care syndrome. And outpatients with post-intensive care syndrome require complex care and coordination. So with that, I'll take any questions. Oh, that was an outstanding talk. Um, I've been here for several years now. When I first came here, I noticed that compared to my previous institution, people who were ventilated did not get tracheostomy as early as, as where I trained. Can you comment? Is there any evidence behind that? Because I was trained that around day 10, if you think about it. But I mean, here, it's people are vented for days. Yeah, I think... Um... There are trials comparing early versus like tracheostomy in the critical care, more MICU patient population. And I think there's some data to suggest that sedation does decrease, but it's hard to predict which patients are gonna need that tracheostomy. Um, but yes, I think that your ICU level sedation and therefore probably your delirium um, probably does improve. Um, I agree here, I think we keep people uh, fenced by an endotracheal tube at a much, much higher rate than I think we did at other institutions where I've been at. Babak. Hello. Uh, great talk, Jenna. Um, I've had the privilege of co-managing VT and VF storm patients with you, which is my wedge of the CCU pie. Are there elements of the ABCD bundle that you deviate from or the data has shown we should deviate from like specific agents that help to reduce the, um, a, the you know, our version of post-critical care syndrome in those patients is the PTSD type symptoms. Are there elements of the ABCDE um, workflow that you deviate from to fix that part of post-critical care syndrome? Specifically for the PTSD and VT patients. 
Yeah, I think so. It's interesting. So I think the only really good data for PTSD in the ICU population, which I didn't really get into, is actually keeping a journal. Um, so it decreases PTSD in the patient population. So I think just like awareness, writing down things, keeping an idea. Patients often have a lot of confusion as they wean sedation and just sort of writing things down and keeping notes that can come back and like reframe reality. A lot of their nightmares and symptoms are just sort of confusion about what actually happened in their ICU length of stay. So having the family write it down or having the patients write it down. And then I think the choice of sedation, so not using benzodiazepines. And then I do think using, not using full sedation would be best, right? A nerve block or something like that in the VT patient population. If we could not intubate and do propofol plus strips, that would certainly decrease delirium and probably PTSD and confusion. You and I talked about this a little bit, but the, the bundle, how much of that do you feel like just from a pragmatic perspective is a reluctance or unawareness, a reluctance for people to push that envelope for the idea of like, oh, but their underlying medical condition is such that they really can't exercise, they can't get up, they can't be mobile. It's not time yet to ventilate, uh, to extubate them. How much of that is just us culturally overreacting to medical illness or kind of not figuring out the balance versus, for example, in the ICUs uh, postoperatively, where they've been very deliberate and very aggressive about extubating people even at two o'clock in the morning? Um, and that seems to really improve overall mortality and everything else. So there's a, it, feel, it feels sometimes like there's a lot of barriers to following through on the bundle um, that are either pragmatic, oh, it's the middle of the night, we don't want to do that, or are perhaps not recognizing the relative balance of the importance of the bundle in preventing all the post-ICU stuff versus the, are you really going to make their hypotension any better or worse right now? What do you think the barriers are to doing it better? I think it's a perception of safety by physicians and nursing that leads to decreased physical physical therapy or therapy driven by nurse. So in multiple institutions, patients walk on ECMO. Um, so you can walk on the ventilator. Patients can have 100 per, be on 100% FiO2 and walk in other institutions. I think we're just simply not set up or prepared to do it. We have a cultural sort of barrier towards doing these things that I think is something that we need to sort of work on. It's not just physicians, it's RT, it's uh, nursing, it's everyone involved in their level of comfort with it. Um, I do think some of our, some of the patient populations that we have like a groin balloon, there is a trial actually, it's a very small trial, but that we've been talking about in um, sort of the small work group in the CCU, but you can walk with a groin balloon pump in a small, yeah, exactly. Um, certainly you can walk with an Impella 5.5 axillary, but you know, an Impella CP in the groin, I don't think anyone has ever done that study. So there are some barriers with mechanical support, but certainly mechanical ventilation, there should be no issue. And ECMO, if it's appropriately cannulated, you can walk. So we think it's just a matter of having the cultural will to do it. And as an extension of that, is that potentially an argument to move much more quickly, even from the outset, to somebody who may need support for a while, to doing axillary instead of groin to really highlight the opportunities for mobility and potentially extubation? I think so. I, although I certainly, I think we have um, in our axillary balloons a lot of uh, other issues that are happening because we're using those balloons sort of off-label and there's a lot of rupture and other issues that are happening. Um, but yeah, I think the more we can do to stop sedation and increase mor morbidity, the better. I'm going to tackle the electronic q and A's. Uh, Leah Shinoda, trip talk, Jana. Thank you. So much of this multidisciplinary effort is driven by our APPs, RNs, PTOTs, nutritionists, et cetera. From your time in RCCU, are there any changes to the rounding structure you would advocate for to increase our ABCDE and Z and the F bundle Im implementation success? Yeah, thanks, Lee. That's a great question. I, I think it is all on our green sheets. I think sometimes we, as cardiologists, get a bit excited about tackling the cardiovascular care in the ICU patients and not necessarily focusing on all of these other things. So I think just making it a hallmark of uh, what we're able to do. And then I would say we are also looking at rolling out, this is going to be a primary nursing run um, a module that should be happening in the CCU with the Johns Hopkins nurse-led mobility scale. Um, and that should be happening. And we're just talking about everyone's HLM level. So that should be coming live soon, where we're talking about what did they do yesterday and what are they going to do today as a primary nurse run 
way to, without even a physical therapist involved, increase patients' mobility in the ICU, which should be part of our rounding sheet relatively soon. Sure. That, that was great. Um, I think one of the things that I, I'm thinking about as you're going through this is so many people go into intensive care, they love doing it because they love the action. You know, you love the excitement of it, you love the acute care aspect of it, and you're talking about chronic care management in the ICU. How do you change that mindset? I know we're talking about some of these, you know, scales and some of these actions, but so much of that is driven by the a change in mindset. Is that something that you think about of saying, like, we're not just treating the patient today, we're trying to treat them for the next six to 12 months? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, I you have to start discharging the patient from the ICU on the day you admit them to the ICU. Um, you should have an idea of how long they're going to need mechanical ventilation um, based on their admission need for mechanical ventilation, and then you should choose your sedation for that. So yes, absolutely. It, you know, I think these are challenging patients to care for. I mean, they're, they break everyone's heart. They suffer immensely while in the ICU, and their outcomes are poor. But they are, as the one you know trial said, 32% of our ICU bed days, right? So we see these patients day in and day out. We care for them. They can become the patients that we don't intensively round on because nothing is changing and everything feels very static. But you know, I think increasing mobility and in changing our frames, our mindset. And I think you know, understanding when we counsel patients towards tracheostomy and things like that, the mortality. <laughs> For that is quite poor, right? Even though these patients make it out of the hospital, their one year mortality is still quite high. So I think these are important conversations about suffering and palliative care and the meaning of life and all of that. So I think a lot of people who go into ICU also have a second hat as a palliative care provider as well. And I would just put in the pitch as a CCU attending that I think one of the things, and comment on this, I'm sure there's data on it, is that the, the chronic acuity, if you will, the bad heart failure, the types of patients we take care of in the ICU is quite different than like when I started where it was a STEMI and you're carrying them through their arrhythmia risk and then they're off. Um, and there are, now we have, you know, they've got an EF of two or they're a failing Fontan or there's something that is by the time they land in the ICU, they've got a whole bunch of comorbidities or, or chronic illnesses that looks more like the MICU. So from my perspective, there seems like cardiology, we are definitely ripe for more folks like you who are actually trained in critical care medicine to bring in some of the rest of that because those of us who are purely trained in cardiology can deal with cardiogenic shock and everything else, but things like the bundle or carrying over some of the things from the MICU or trauma units and that sort of stuff is not necessarily our, um, our bailiwick. So I'm, that's less of a question than a thank you for joining us and um, helping us to raise our critical care standards. And hopefully we'll get more of you because I know the fellows are always very intrigued by the idea of, ooh, I kind of like what Jana does. Um, any other questions from anybody in the room? And I think we got the Q&A. So thanks so much, everybody. Uh, thank you, Jana, for an excellent talk. Thank you, Joan, for all your work this year. And we'll see everybody September 8th. Enjoy the summer.